Good afternoon, everybody. And Raven and JES, thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you today to talk about childcare. The way we think about childcare has changed rather dramatically. Rather than outdated views of childcare as a private family matter, particularly for women, and for our youngest not even being more perhaps than babysitting in the old way of thinking, we now appreciate that childcare is infrastructure for workforce productivity and that quality of care for infants and toddlers the earliest years determines if a person will become an asset or otherwise to society in the future. Our evolving thinking is in step with our changing economy and our society. We're turning away from these narrow views of the past to seeing childcare as a civic priority that pays off in many ways and is defining in whether a city like Erie can prosper and compete. I wrote an article uh, that JES published in the summer of 2021 entitled, Caring for Erie's Economy, Childcare is Economic Development. I posed the question, what if Erie became the leading city in the United States where childcare is universal? I think actually now I'd say that childcare is both economic development and community development because today we appreciate the two are joined at the hip. With, without strong community and families, workers won't stay, nor will they come. Without workers, many of which need caregivers for their children, companies won't stay, nor will they come. And in turn, there will not be tax base to shore up our community to be able to afford high quality of life for everybody. The fortunate link here is that households with children and population in the increasingly prime child care bearing years are positively associated with economic health. Family friendly is today's essential capital, thus firmly establishing that we need a balance in the type of policy and civic incentives that we deploy to pursue prosperity at the city level. As the organization, national organization, Good Jobs First states, in short, if elected officials prioritize building infrastructure and providing services that most benefit residents, employers will come. So the realities of today's economy and community that put childcare on a different plane include, and I'll give a checklist. One, we have an economy where for many, uh, we're forced to work uh, two jobs because the wages don't pay a living wage. And childcare outside the home uh, is unattainable for, for many. And we don't treat childcare as a public program. Today's demographics place many cities as at one hand getting older and at the same time getting younger, where a declining skilled workforce collabor uh, is tied directly to uh, baby boomers retiring. Labor is now a scarce commodity. Another factor in our, our changing economy, child caregivers are often said to be the workforce behind the workforce. Indeed, we need more social workers, healthcare workers, and teachers. But when you think about it, they don't make it to their jobs in many cases without caregivers for their young children. And so for many avocations, access to child care and the expense often comes unfortunately down to a work or no work uh, decision. We know that women are increasingly integral to our economy. For example, the US, US Bureau of Labor and Statistics in 2021 indicated that mothers with children under age six comprised 65.6% of the labor force. Thus, as access to affordable childcare increases uh, women's ability to participate in the workforce uh, and to retain them, it's contributing to gender equity, childcare. Also, and now businesses have become strong advocates themselves for childcare. Across all industries, childcare is now one of the top reasons that employees cite for leaving their jobs. And it's even more critical for people who work in frontline deskless positions, which aren't able to reach the flexibility and maybe different childcare arrangements 
that those who are able to work from home or remotely do. And particularly good luck if you happen to be a second or third shift worker, which is increasingly a driver of an economy like here in Erie, of trying to find what is already uh, a scarcity of childcare during normal hours. A recent Erie Times News article speaks to the pinch that hospitals are feeling in staffing. As they work to fill gaps in their ranks, hospitals have been employing a, a creative variety of tactics to attract and retain people. And a recent survey by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania indicated that since 2022, nearly 40% of our hospitals across the Commonwealth provide access to child care services. So no wonder that child care is now a very powerful recruitment strategy. For example, many businesses are starting to offer in-house child care as it's less expensive for them than having to replace staff. According to the company that's called Care for Business, 90% of employers say child care benefits have a positive impact on ta talent retention and recruitment. Get this, equal to retirement plans and slightly outperforming even paid time off and health care benefits. Also evolving is our understanding of who are the top performers in our, or drivers in our economy. In the year 2000, 25 years ago at Sustainable Pittsburgh, where I worked for 20 years, we collaborated with a Jefferson Educational Society headliner, Richard Florida, on his work that was the precursor to his Amazon best-selling books, The Rise of the Creative Class. His first report, which we published, was focused on the wants, needs, and expectations of young, talented knowledge workers. The premise was that those young techies were really a silver bullet for economic prosperity of a city. But even that think thinking is evolving to also focus more heavily on arguably the most stalwart and more appreciated contributors to our economy, those in the childbearing family years. Those tech workers, and I heard CEOs in Pittsburgh say it often, we can't keep them in time. They want to settle down, have children, enjoy a family life, and suddenly those bohemian lifestyles take on very different uh, priorities. So now it's better understood that the silver bullet to retaining talent now points to the need not so much of the creative class, but the procreative class that experience stronger economic growth. I'll give some examples. For example, families with young children are a so source uh, of strong economic growth because they spend the most money on the local economy. Services for children obviously are an important part of local and regional economies. And thinking longer term investment in children builds a productive future workforce leading to long term growth. So not only is shoring up child care services for families a wise strategy, but according to Laura Reese of Michigan State University in her research entitled Creative Class or Procreative Class Implications for Local Economic Development Policy, she states, the record of local economic development incentives appears weak. She finds that financial incentives in particular do not appear to lead to economic growth and actually seem to make local economies worse. This, she says, suggests that local development policies have no effect on economic health at best and are detrimental at worst. She continues, because many development incentives entail significant costs to communities, both in direct expenses and tax expenditures, their lack of correlation to economic health should raise concerns about their cost effectiveness. She poses, what does appear to be related to economic growth? The answer, based on her research and data, seems to be investments in policies and activities that make the community a better place to live and a better place for families. Indeed, according to recent work by uh, Fourth, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Route 50 uh, periodical, studies from the Upjohn Institute show that most companies would have made the same location decisions without taxpayer subsidies. Meanwhile, schools make up the largest cost 
in these communities, meaning they suffer the most when companies are granted breaks in property taxes. And a poorly funded education system is less likely to yield a skilled and competitive workforce over the long haul, thus creating long-term economic costs that make a region less attractive for businesses and residents. So this puts in perspective uh, the point I made in that article in 2021 about Erie having the possibility to become a leading city where childcare is accessible, affordable, and high quality. Leading cities are instituting childcare strategies for working families in order to attract and retain talent, to grow, and for workforce development, and thus business success. Economic development, community development, and social supports are now better seen as mutually reliant and supportive. But all is not well in this childcare economic sector. Compared to our traditional view of infrastructure, childcare is not part of city planning, nor is it a budgeted local government service. Local childcare supply, demand, and thus gaps are not tracked and addressed on municipal levels. Childcare providers face a dizzying array of regulations. Families are largely left on their own to figure out the very complicated process for accessing limited subsidies from our state, for example. At a local level, demand for childcare uh, usually exceeds supply. Wait lists cause nightmares. Quality care can be hard to find, let alone, let alone any care at all. And fees are high despite pay for caregivers being paltry. For example, here in Erie, it's an average of like $11 uh, per hour. Investment in the childcare system is not adequately supporting our workforce and thus economy, despite actually being an essential form of infrastructure for economic success, akin to broadband, transportation, and a hot topic presently in Erie, airport service. The toll on our economy statewide is staggering. According to a report this time last year from the nonprofit Ready Nation and the Pennsylvania Early Learning Investment Commission, gaps in Pennsylvania's childcare system are stressing the state's working parents and costing families, employers, and taxpayers about $6.65 billion annually in lost earnings, productivity, and tax revenue. Erie's economic performance should at least give our leaders pause to consider taking a more balanced approach in our economic development strategies. The wake-up calls keep coming. Some examples, according to Erie News Now in 2020, Wallet Hub ranked Erie as the slowest growing city in America. In June of 2022, Go Erie Now reported the Wall Street Journal, which worked with Moody's Analytics using US Labor Department data, ranked Erie's job market as number 313 on the list of 326 small metro job markets. And last weekend, according to yourerie.com, the annual Milken Institute Index ranked Erie near the bottom of best performing small cities in the United States. It's time for Erie to double down on supporting families' need for quality, affordable childcare to support town attraction and address this real barrier to workforce participation and thus our economy, let alone for the well-being of our children whose care is the ultimate expression of what we as a community value. So the JES and the Erie Community Foundation, working together, have mobilized a team to tackle the issues. The name of the effort is the Erie Early Child Care Investment Policy Initiative. In order to maximize the prospects for impact and to in turn develop uh, solutions that are scalable, the team will focus on access to child care for the most difficult uh, and formative years, infants, and toddlers up to three years in age, or the first uh, critical just one over 1,000 uh, days of development. And we'll focus specifically on the city of Erie. An expert team has been assembled for this initiative, and we have a series of incremental tasks before us. The challenges to be surmounted in this six-month phase one initiative are to quantify the demand, the supply, and then the gaps in access to quality, affordable childcare for infants and toddlers in the city of Erie. 
The next challenge is to identify the most impactful ways to intervene in the complex child care system. Then we'll estimate the costs of those most impactful interventions, and then uh, the most plausible long-term funding sources to close those gaps. The bold proposition is to come up with practical rep recommendations that are ripe to be implemented in a phase two effort, all aimed to approve the economy through small smart policy and investment in today's young children. Bruce Katz, who is another Jefferson Educational Society headliner, frequently engages, um, and with whom we also worked years ago at Sustainable Pittsburgh, has a mantra that change, uh, the challenge for small metro areas is to hone your advantages to the point they are known. And Bruce also likes to quote Dolly Parton, who says, find out who you are and do it on purpose. The world is changing fast, and maybe it's not such a bad thing that Erie is a little behind the times, because old school Erie has a timeless strength and an offering as a family-friendly town. So let's get to work on lifting Erie and position it as a role model in access to quality, affordable childcare. And with that, I will start to introduce the expert team assembled for this initiative. Yeah. So, Elena, would you come up and grab a microphone and we'll start a little conversation. So our uh, first of six experts assembled uh, to work on this initiative is Elena Como, she's the director of Pennsylvania's Early Learning Resource Center, Region 1, and chief executive officer of the Northwest Institute of Research. In her roles, she manages the Commonwealth's Child Care Works subsidized child care program that helps low-income families pay for part of their child care fees. And she serves as a hub for child care information, serving Erie, Crawford, Mercer, and Venango counties. So Elena, in your role, you are a hub for information, a conduit to the state. You work with all the child care providers in these counties. Uh, there's probably no one who knows the on the ground, big, you might say, cat bird picture better than you. We're all curious, how does Erie, uh, the city, the county, stack up com and compare to others within our region and maybe uh, nationally as well? And how do you feel it's all going? So how is it all going? Um, I pulled data for everyone this morning. And if you are one of 55 um, families in the city of Erie and you woke up this morning, you learned from our office that your infant, so that baby between six weeks and one year old, is still on a waiting list which means there's 55 families that can't go to work because their child doesn't have care. And the reason they're on our waiting list, and these would all be qual individuals qualified for um, low-income subsidized assistance through our office, they can't go to work because there's not access. There's not an open, available child care space for them right now. So that reality is real in the city of Erie as well as across the Commonwealth. I think Erie has done an amazing job, as you're going to hear from some of our other panel experts, in the quality area. So we do have some absolutely wonderful, high-quality child care programs across our city. I would love to see that number be 100% um, currently. It's 44%, which is just slightly below the state average of 46%. But our goal is that all families have access to high quality early learning experiences and that when they're ready to go back to work, they have a space for their child. Was that my six minutes?
This is Tiffany Levette. She is founder of Her Power Inc., which owns and operates ABC 24 Hour Child Care, and found, founder of the National Association for the Advancement of Black and Brown Child Care Providers, and co owner of Levette's Enterprises. She specializes in training new child care business owners and is leading a special project for advancement of black, indigenous, people of color, or BIPAC owners. So Tiffany, you are a, uh, an entrepreneur, a community le a leader that I've been delighted to get to know in many ways, helping out our town, our region. Can you share with us a little bit about why the first 1,000 days are so critical uh, and, and a little bit about the importance of cultural competence as well in, in uh, early development of our children? Thank you, Court, for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to present myself before you today with one earring missing. Raise your hand if you always have it together every single time. <laughs> you always have it together. Raise your hand if you miss the bar sometime like I did today. The reality is I lost my earring in the airport. It's my favorite pair of earrings, so I refuse to let them go. And I, I, wanted, I, looked, I looked this morning and I said, I can't go with one earring missing. But my question to myself was, why not? The idea is that we have to continue to create the opportunity, the platform, and the conversation that is inclusive of all people. So I'm appreciative of being a part of this team and this initiative for what Jefferson has done and what the Erie Community um, Foundation has done with this. So thank you for inviting me and allowing me to come to the table, though I'm not all the way done. So <clears throat> the, a part of the, the, the concern is how do we guarantee that our children will meet their, meet their maximums in that first 1,000 days? And in order for that to happen, especially in the BIP, when it comes to BIPOC providers and those who provide care to a large number of children that come from the BIPOC community, we have to have resources in order to pour in. And so one thing that I've noticed has happened is that there, there's a STAR program. And so one thing that's happened is that you see a lot of um, child care providers, owners, directors that are of color that have lower star levels when you look at our white counterparts. And so what does that mean and what is a star? The star program is um, a quality program and so there are star one, two, three, all the way to four. So when you get your license, you're automatically a one and you go from there. So part of the barrier is that, for example, in Erie Region 1, which Elena, is, ELRC is a Region 1, that we have a total, when this data was given to me, about 137 providers total. And so out of those providers, 104 identify as being Caucasian operated uh, facilities and the other 33 identify as being BIPOC, whether that is black owned, whether it's Latina owned or Asian or you know what other, other category they may fit in. That is the BIPOC community represented as providers. And so in this group, we have, for example, for star one, which is the lowest level of the quality rating, so they receive the smallest amount of reimbursement. And so 46 of them in our star one are the Caucasian group, and you have 20 that are BIPOC. When you move the star two, you'll see 24 Caucasian. You'll see six from the BIPOC community. Star three, we have 10, and there's one star three BIPOC-owned facility, which is mine. And then we have our star four facilities, which 24 of those are ca identifies Caucasian and six identifies being the BIPOC community. So we look at star ones, 43% being those uh, BIPOC, identifying as BIPOC, and star fours were only represented as 25% of the total number. And so when resources impact our facilities, that ultimately impacts the quality of care that the child gets. We have to be able to afford to pay quality teachers. A teacher cannot survive working for our facilities making 11 and $12 an hour. Not at all. So something that we've done in my facility, let me know my time, I know we got six minutes. In my facility is we had to figure out how to supplement in order to increase that quality at our center. So what we did with our last little bit of money we had, we purchased a food truck. And so what we've been able to do with that food truck is use the resources to continue to pour back into our facility, regardless of what grants were coming through, regardless of what our opportunities or partnerships were there. We had to figure out how to survive on our own. 
These are the opportunities where we have to look in our BIPOC community of business owners to see how can we continue to share information about uh, opportunities and resources and programs that are available to our counterparts so we at least can be competitive and also assist our children in that first 1,000 days. So what's happening with the project that we're working on right now? As black and brown child care providers, we continue to fall below the curve when it comes to the highest quality rating. And so that means that our annual revenues are lower. We are not maximizing the amount of return that we receive for our care because we are not at that star three and star four level. So what we've done is created a, um, a national coalition <clears throat> which I'm really excited that people hear my ideas and follow my vision and I'm thankful for that. So we started a research where we've collect, begin collecting data from um, the regions in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania first to kind of see what that breakdown is, similar to the one that I shared with you from Region 1. And the solution to the problem that we have is to empower those three and four facilities to mentor the star ones and twos so that they can ultimately increase their star, le star levels. At least we can start there. It's not a grant that we have to wait four and five years for. It's not um, asking anything of, of more than what we should provide. So these, these additional funds that come in helps us to pay for high quality teachers, which we were able to afford a preschool teacher that is not cheap <laughs> if we wanna be able to be competitive. And we also have to start at higher wages and we have to be able to create positions within the facility management positions and so on. In order to increase and obtain the one through star four levels, we have to include and have these providers be a part of a mentorship program where we connect with them. It's something about BIPOC community, and I can say this because I'm from the community, we really communicate a little different. Um, so this network, the uh, child care network was actually created first. So a lot of information that we get from Elena, we share. The, a lot of information that I get from the state advisory boards that I'm on, I share with this group. And that's access to information. And as a result, we actually have two other people who have increased star levels to star four since being a part of this. Um, so which a home provider, which is kind of rare, a part of our network has increased to a star four level. And we're excited about it. So the more we um, share platforms, the more we engage and build partnerships with each other, we'll have access to resources to provide quality care in those first 1,000 days of life. Thank you very much. Not able to be with us today is Andrea Heberlein. She's executive director of the Pennsylvania Early Learning Investment Commission, which is a statewide entity of businesses that collect the data, the expressions of need of their employees, and turns that into compelling information, particularly for our state legislature, and as a strong voice uh, for increased allocation of public supports for the child care system. Uh, working closely with her, is uh, Karen Grimm Thomas, who's just joined us. Karen is the Early Childhood Education Strategies Advisor with the Creative Child Care Solutions Program of the Pennsylvania Key. She helps employers identify and address the child care needs of their employees and invest in local early learning systems as a means to attract and retain staff and create positive work environments. So Karen, you have a remarkable insider uh, view to the wants and needs of employers, but more importantly, their employees. And the two have to one <laughs> talk and understand one another. Uh, when you engage with a company, what do you typically find? And what should businesses be thinking about with regard to uh, the child care needs of their personnel? That's a big question. Thanks very much. Um, and it's just very exciting to be part of this initiative and have it start. Um, for a city to kind of take this on and really look at this issue is exciting to me. Um, I mean, ultimately, what we have is a, an issue with funding in, in, of the child care system. And the ultimate solution to that is going to have to come from the federal or the state level. And we're not seeing those things coming anytime soon. And so, the idea that a city would start to think about this and take it on is really exciting. And it also means that businesses 
in, in the absence of having that bigger picture, that bigger funding stream coming in, need to really start to think about it because court really laid out what these impacts are to businesses when their employees don't have childcare and the, the costs that it, you know, the economic impact on their business. So usually when I start to work with a, an employer, um, there's a couple of things. It's really about education. It's helping employers understand why childcare is a broken market, um, what the, how we've traditionally funded childcare leaves them very vulnerable to the issues that are happening right now. And so we talk a lot about how you tweak those funding streams to make them less vulnerable to those things. So there's a lot of education. Businesses are coming in at lots of different levels. So some of them really are very aware that there are issues. Some of them um, know that there's a problem, but they don't know where it's coming from. And so it's really about not making assumptions. It's about helping them understand what their employees are looking for, what their very specific challenges are when it comes to childcare, and what they want from childcare. How does a family want to get their care? It's a very personal decision. Um, and there's a lot of ways that families can go about doing that. And so making sure that the solutions that a business is trying to implement are things that those employees really want and are going to take advantage of um, is a really key in the conversations that I have with them. So it's about helping them understand you know, that they don't always know the answer until you start to ask employees. So we start out really, we're very data driven. We collect a lot of information. We collect data from, from the employees to really understand what they're looking for. Um, the other thing I think is really helping businesses understand that it's not a one size fits all. A lot of times businesses will come to us because they have space and they think, oh, we want to turn it into a childcare, an onsite center. And helping them understand the lift that that is um, the cost that typically comes from needing to retrofit space so that it's appropriate to have groups of children in it is, is, can be really high. And the return then can sometimes only impact a portion of their staff versus thinking about the other things that they can do that would impact a larger group of folks and the larger community. Child care is an ecosystem. What happens in one part of the system has ripple effects in others. And there's a real possibility of people doing something really great for a portion of their employees, they can actually have some negative impacts on a community's ability to access care, particularly because we're in a, this staffing crisis where if one program has the resources to uh, you know, hire folks, that means that some other program might not. And so how do we make sure that whatever is being put into place is, is accessible to the largest amount of people possible in a community? Because you can have a great flourishing business and your employees can have access to care, but if that business is located in a community that is struggling to find care for the rest of the community, it's not gonna really help them very much. It's still gonna impact your business. So it's the idea that not one solution is going to do it. Um, it's about layering those solutions and using that data to really dis make some really good decisions about how to use the, you know, how to invest and how to help the, the system. Karen, that certainly begs all of you a lot of follow-on questions. Rena, would you join us, please? It's a pleasure to introduce to you all Rena Irwin. She's the Chief Executive Officer uh, at Child Development Centers, Inc. Now, Rena oversees the largest provider in our region of up to some 2,000 children. The growth that she has led of CDC is in part tied to assuming responsibility in the region for federal and state Head Start uh, programs in Erie, Crawford, and Venango counties. Rena, I've learned so much from you about uh, the hurdles that a startup uh, has, faces as a child care provider, uh, and with that, ways in which possibly Erie could help not only those that are currently in business to grow to, as Tiffany was saying, achieve higher level of the star quality rating system, but even new ones to enter the market. And uh, if you would share some insights on that, and also maybe if you see economies of scale that could be shared across providers. Thanks, Court. Uh, first of all, opening up a child care center is not an easy task. Um, we are licensed by the Department of Human Services. So to open, first you have to make sure that you're in a proper zoning district, or that is a whole other path of going before the zoning board to request being able to help children in that specific area. 
and then we have a licensing, you fill out a licensing application and a representative from the state comes to the site, does everything from measure every square foot um, of the classroom to see how many kids you can have, the outdoor space, all of that, and then they begin to look at your staff. Uh, do you have a center director? Do you have a group supervisor? What positions do you have um, in place? And then you, you become licensed. Uh, you're on a provisional license for six months, and then the state will come back and do another inspection, and at that point, they will look at all your staff files, and they'll do a random sample of children's files and look at the space again to make sure that it is worthy um, to have children in it. All of CDC's centers are star four, all 15 of our early childhood centers. Uh, you cannot apply for stars until you're on a full license. So like what Karen was saying, that the funding is out of whack <coughs> right uh, on day one because the tiered reimbursement to be a star four, you can't even think about that for six months. So then you're operating your center for six months knowing that you're going to lose money. So programs have a hard time weathering that storm. Um, so if there was a way that those things could change, because it is all about funding, it's no different than selling a widget. We need to have a surplus at the end of the day um, or we aren't going to make it. Uh, there are different funding amounts depending on what program. It's a very complicated funding environment uh, for programs to consider. And if you're a small program, you do not have, you, you know, you don't have the experts even on staff in HR or finance to help you with the knowledge that you need to run this business is what it is. Uh, economies of scale would be really helpful to small providers, especially in HR and in finance, so that programs have the expertise to make good financial decisions to, first of all, weather that first six-month storm, get to a tiered reimbursement if you have the capability of getting to a star four, uh, and then just the day-to-day -day challenges of paying enough wages to keep our staff especially the degree teachers, because we're constantly competing with a school district, uh, and they're good at taking them from us. So we'll get them when they first graduate. They'll stay with us. They'll get to a level two, and then, then they'll depart and head to the school district. So there's a never-ending battle not only to maintain the quality, but to keep our people um, with us. And at CDC, we have about 475 employees. Um, so, you know, the struggle is real to constantly be um, dealing with that. Uh, Rena, just a thought. What does the state say about the education that's required of a child care center uh, owner or leader? Uh, the, own, the child care center director must have at least an associate degree. Um, you also need a group supervisor. And in the Department of Human, Human Services world, that person does not necessarily need to be a teacher. They could have a degree in, in human services, but you still need a degree for every 45 children. Um, but if you're in pre-K counts, and if you care about quality and star four and all of that, our preschool teachers must have early childhood degrees, um, at least an associate degree so that the uh, curriculum is taught by somebody who is actually trained in that environment. Um, we use creative curriculum at child development centers. Our teachers are assessed the fidelity of implementing that curriculum. You have to be a trained person to be able to do that. Thank you. Michelle, would you come join us? So I'm pleased to introduce you to Michelle Harkins. She's executive director of Early Connections, Inc., a leading organization in our region for early care and education. 
from birth through school age, providing direct service as well as training and planning leadership. Early Connections under Michelle's leadership uh, is currently working with the state on an apprentice training program for child care workers. She also has been administering for some years uh, a, a fund to help uh, provide support to families in need of assistance with child care. And she currently has ascended to be the chair of the Pennsylvania Association of the Education of Young Children. Michelle, uh, if you could start us in an exercise, we're going to put the room to work uh, on some of the formative work of this team. What do you see, having heard from uh, the others, as some of the areas of challenge in the child care system as uh, perhaps the most opportune places to intervene in the system here in the city of Erie toward a goal of increasing the number of quality, accessible, affordable slots for infants and toddlers? And everybody, if you might refer to the matrix that perhaps you picked up when you came in, because we're going to be asking your ideas too. Well, I took notes as I thought about this meeting. Um, you know, when we think about state and federal funding, there's still children not being served. So we want to stress that. And I agree with this group. It's not just a silver bullet. There's many things that need to be done and can be done locally. Um, but before we talk about anything as far as solutions to this issue, whatever, whatever it may be, um, because we need to have group consensus, we need to talk about our infant and toddler child care professionals. So the, they have such a strong need for an hourly rate. I refer, and a rate with equity, um, because there doesn't need to be competition. We all are trying to serve these children with quality. So I always refer to these child care professionals, or they call them child care workers, as our teachers, because they are. Um, as we talk about this, if, if you could see what they could do and what they're doing in the classroom, and I'm sure anyone would open their doors to you taking a look at what happens in the infant and toddler classrooms. They're working with them throughout the day. They have a curriculum. They are learning, they're assessing these children three times a day. We have standards and regulations that we have to adhere to, and we should, right? These are our littlest learners. We have to help them. The first five years uh, shared some information. I, I would say Nick Scott Jr., who is a member of the Early Learning Investment Commission, always has shared this so well that, and I'll, I'll quote the first five years. Um, Throughout the years from birth to age five, a child's brain develops more and more rapidly than any other time in life. So we need to capture this and help them. And while the genetics play a role, a significant role, scientific research has made it clear that the quality of a child's experiences in the first few years of life, positive or negative, helps shape how their brain develops. So these experiences have a lasting impact on their health and their ability to learn and succeed in school and life. So why don't we want to come up with some solutions here? Our quality centers, they provide quality experiences. It's an expectation, as I said, and we wouldn't want it any other way. We need to look at how we can improve the hourly wages of our quality childcare professionals with equity so that we can attract and retain these professionals, these teachers. Yes, retrain, retain them. We need to provide the stability and the consistency that our children deserve and the families deserve as well. Because when things are stable at child care centers, their parents and guardians are at work and things are stable in their hearts and their minds and they can stay at work. And that's so very important for our economy, for our, our manufacturing sector, for businesses throughout Erie County. So, if I look at the infant and toddlers that we serve at Early Connections in the city, our city center location, they're full, however, you know, with children, however, we could hire the staff that we need. We could serve twice as many children at our city locations. And please know um, that once we have these child care quality teachers, we need to make sure that they go to school. Sometimes we, we hire uh, teachers that are great 
people and they're invested in, in teaching the children, but they don't have the correct degree. So how can we help them? How can we train them and, and help them um, get a degree on the pay that we provide them? There are apprenticeship programs where they could go to school for little to no cost. This is something that the state rolled out, you know, I believe in 2019. Um, and I know ELIC was part of sharing that information. There is a model that every um, part of the state follows to help teachers go to school for little to no cost. So once we get them, we need to retain them. So that's very, very important. But remember, we need to raise their wages and with equity. Number two, now let's look at the cost for care, right? And this is something you deal with all the time and talk to businesses about. How can we help our families in Erie? Elena could elaborate a little bit more um, on these figures, but full-time care for infants and toddlers range between 13 and 19,000 a year, full-time care. So, great. Great, the reimbursement, the wage sheets Elena did provide to you. Thank you. That helps out a lot. We, yes, it does give a nice comparison across the state. We need to look at the local cost of serving our children and figure out how they can best be served. If we created a model to serve them with, could we pay for all of their care, you know, all of these children? Or could we partially award them a scholarship to qualifying families and maybe look at a tiered uh, reimbursement or scholarship to the families depending on their wages. Now think about that. Some have said these parents should pay more. I've heard that in the community. These parents should pay more. We have parents that tell us that are private pay, if you raise your, your tuition, I'm going to have to pull our children out. And they're working full time, two parents. So let's think about that. And they, they can't qualify for child care subsidy. If we look at something similar to the EFF scholarship, Erie's Future Fund model, which would help infants and toddlers from families with a household income of up to 350% of the income guidelines, and of course prioritize those with risk factors that could be established by, a, by us. That might be a good consideration, one of the considerations, I think. And here's some information about Erie's Future Fund, just if, if no one, if not everyone knows. Erie's Future Fund was established in 2011 by Erie County. So we had a group of leaders. It was outgrowth of the Erie Community Foundation's Childhood Advi Advisory Panel, United Way Success by Six, um, Business and Succeeders, civic leaders throughout our community, they wanted to impact the families and the children, the economy now and in the future. So they all got together and created Erie's Future Fund. And early childhood research shows that well-focused early childhood education investments can produce high public returns. And because of Erie's Future Fund, We've been able to serve approximately 1,700 preschoolers at this point with high quality early childhood education throughout Erie County, preparing them for kindergarten. Not only kindergarten, these skills, these soft skills they even learn, help them throughout their life. It in turn helped them throughout graduation, the future workforce, and in their community. Could we set up a scholarship model similar for infants and toddlers? Wouldn't it be great to serve more children at this age, again, during the window of time that their brain is developing so rapidly? We need to consider the cost for sure. It's a lot of money to serve infants and toddlers. How could we sustain what we created? Could we invest what we would um, receive in donations in some way to provide interest to help maintain and sustain this initiative? Someone suggested to me, suggested to me just this week, would it work to have businesses invest in a model similar to how the insurance company, um, for a lack of better words, <laughs> um, where their employees would be able to send their children to a high quality program, would there be a way to invest um, into the system that would pay for these spots? 
I appreciate that suggestion, and I think we're open to any suggestions to make this work. So the two thoughts I'd like to offer is to elevate the child care professional's hourly wage at, with equity and help families pay for care. Because there's still families asking, how can I go to a quality center? I can't afford it. And we have to close the door on them. Please help us open that door. All right, so uh, the initiative, uh, as I said, is incremental in the tasks ahead. Uh, first, one has to quantify the need in the community and then the supply in the community to arrive at what is the gap in terms of child care in the city of Erie. And then the natural question is, if there were more resource potentially available, where would you invest it in this complex system? And you have heard uh, insights to various elements of the challenges within that system. Then if one arrives at the intervention or the remedy that uh, is most impactful, the next question would be to cost it. All right, what would it cost to address that? And then finally, the big question is, where would the resources come from? At present, we are deep into the first tax, which is quantifying the need, the supply, and the gap. And with the team's expert assistance, a uh, very detailed survey has been developed that Elena, through her Early Learning Resource Center, will soon be disseminated to the over 100 formal licensed child care centers in the city of Erie. While that task is going on, we're starting to think ahead, and before you is a matrix that dabbles in the question of where would you attempt to intervene in this complex system in order to increase the supply, provided the data does indeed bear out, which we presume and which is well known around the country, that supply is inadequate and more so uh, is inequitable as we have deserts, uh, childcare deserts, kind of like food deserts, uh, throughout our municipality. Uh, Michelle has led the conversation by putting her vote on the board for increased pay for childcare workers and increased financial support uh, for families as they uh, try to uh, bear the load of paying for uh, child care, which would go up if teachers are paid more. Uh, quickly, Rena, starting with you, if we could go down and let us know what you feel are your top uh, places to intervene. Uh, just pick, let's for argument's sake, say your number one choice. and. Then I'll invite the panel and we'll bring microphones out to the, you, the audience, uh, to challenge that and say, no, I think this would be more important and why. Uh, you are helping us with our early stages of research. Rena, what, what's the number one most impactful place to intervene in this system? Hmm. Well, I know the answer is wages of staff. For me personally, my favorite one is the construction of new centers. Um, you cannot provide child care to children if you don't have a building. So the first thing is the building before we even get the staff. Um, and space is difficult. Um, first of all, it has to be at a certain level of quality. It has to be available. It has to be zoned. Um, you have to be able to afford to renovate it or, or build it. Um, so for me personally, uh, construction of new centers is high on my list of priorities. Thank you. Tiffany, what's the number one? What would you do if somebody dropped a bucket of gold in your car? Well, <clears throat> if we're looking at um, ABC, so for us, we have an issue with construction. So the number one thing, of course, would be teachers' wages. To okay. increase that, that's something that's really important. But for ABC, the second item would be renovations. Because if we had renovations, then we can increase the number of children that we provide care for. Like we, oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm looking at court, my apologies. 
I guess, closer to but, the um, Yeah. So the number one thing would be to increase subsidies for teachers. So to provide that subsidy to providers so that we can pay teachers a higher wage, that's one. And then the second thing in regards to ABC would be concerning renovations. So the opportunity to build out, um, if you have the space to do that, or to build out other centers. So those would be the two top four ABC. Great, thank you. Yep. Elena. On? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, <laughs> great. I'm going to throw out a few more data points. Um, so what is very interesting to the city of Erie um, compared to the other areas in the state of Pennsylvania when you look at your maps that are on the table, the poverty map, the child care desert map, I think where Erie is very unique right now um, is that we have the second highest relative population um, in the state, which means some form of relative, a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a um, sibling who is over the age of 18 may possibly be caring for that child. Typically why they are caring for that child is because there's a huge shortage of second and third shift care in the, in the city. And so if you work at a hospital or you're in the entertainment industry, and I think Erie has done a phenomenal job making it a destination to visit city, but for those of us that are living here and working in these fabulous places to visit, um, Splash Lagoon, the Bayfront, Prescott, you're staying in hotels, all these great things in our city, you need workers, and if those workers have families, they need second or third shift care, which we have a great shortage of. So I'm right with Rena on we need infrastructure for centers. If those centers are gonna provide some second and third shift care, um, if they're not providing second and third shift care, my second solution is miracle homes, because as uh, Tiffany said, our family child care home, uh, our family child care homes, our in-home, our relative providers, are typically the ones that are providing that second and third shift care. However, most of their homes can't meet our state regulations, so we really need to build what we call and what the GM Team Foundation is working on miracle homes that really meet those state requirements and we're doubling as a home for a family as well as a high quality child care space for um, those families that are needing second and third shift care. So renovation, I'm on board. Of course we have to, con the compensation crisis has been a crisis for as long as I've been in this industry over 40 years. Um, we have to solve that, and that is, as everyone has said, it's the three-legged stool. We have private funding, we have, um, we have private funding, we have government funding, and we need local funding, whether that comes from our businesses or foundations or philanthropy. Try sitting on a two-legged stool. It gets exhausting, and you might be falling over. With the three legs, we heard, hold our child care system strong. Thank you. Care. So I'm going to be difficult, Court, because the work I do, the idea of coming up with one solution is just not, it doesn't work. These are all very integrated and, in, you know, they're, they're, they're woven together kinds of things. Um, so yes, I think ultimately, though, the compensation is the issue right now. Um, and that's the other part of this, is we need to be thinking, how do we get through this immediate crisis, but then how are we going to build a sustainable system? So the immediate crisis is really about taking the providers that are existing in the city right now that are not operating at capacity, have you know empty rooms or rooms that are not as full as they should be because the staffing isn't there, and dealing with that. I also think the... It's about um, expanding who's eligible for subsidies. Right now we have a very limited definition of who's eligible for subsidies. Families have to make 
um, 200% of poverty to be qualified. Lately, in the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, the state did increase the exit threshold, so families can make up to 300% of poverty to be eligible for subsidy. But if you're a family that makes 230% of poverty and you have a baby, your first baby, you can't get into the system. So, and even for families that are making 300, 400% of poverty, the Federal Office of Child Care has deemed 7% of a family's income is what they would call affordable, if that's what they're paying for childcare. You know, there's no place, there is no county, there's one actually county, in Adams County, home-based school age care is 7.2% of that county's median income. That's the only place. Everywhere else is everywhere from 10 to over 20% when you're talking for center-based infant care. So even a family that's making what a lot of us would call a decent income, cannot afford care. And then when you add onto it the idea that these are families that are at a particular time in their life where they have other expenses. So when you're trying to spend 20% of your income on care and you also have a mortgage and you probably have student loans, it becomes really unaffordable. And so families are making some decisions where their kids are probably not in the safest care as possible. And I agree with Elena, there needs to be some emphasis and some look thought about those relative providers because that can be really great care. I don't want to at all imply that relative providers provide substandard care. In a lot of situations, that's the best care for families, whether it's because of the non-traditional hours or whether it's because it's conveniently located in their community, it's culturally responsive, it's, it can be really amazing. But we need to have better connections to those providers and we need to have systems in place where they feel connected. And we also need to help families understand Regardless of where your care is being offered, these are the things you should be looking for. This is what quality, safe care is. And that can happen if we can support those relative providers. So I'm not going to give you one. They're all together. And they, we need to think about the short-term, immediate crisis, and then start to think about those long-term strategies that everybody else has talked about that's going to build a really comprehensive, um, sustainable system in Erie. And thank you for the work that you and others do to educate the business community because ultimately their support will be critical uh, in this quest. And uh, Michelle, I think we already heard from you on your priorities. Anything to add? I kind of spilled the beans already, <laughs> but <laughs> but I do agree. I mean, okay. I think that it's going to take many layers well, let's, of Let's get to hearing from our audience. Um, we're going to share microphones around uh, because it's important that you speak into the mic for uh, the, the recording of the program. Um, for sure, cities around the country are presently looking at lots of different creative funding sources. But as I mentioned before, until we know uh, what the most impactful places to intervene in the system are, it doesn't really make sense to be trying to talk about what the funding source is. That's going to be another triage type conversation like this. But what did you hear? that surprised you, and uh, where would you put your vote on the matrix of the most logical place to intervene in the system? I, I may be going a little off your question, but um, by defining it as just the city, I think that's a little bit artificial because a lot of the people who are working second and third shift are up, up in the hotels. They're in the plastic factories out west of Pittsburgh. They're way out um, the plastic factories towards Girard even. And, and I know of a parent who was working on the, out west who was bringing her child to ABC using public transportation. Now, there is no public transportation for people who are working second and third shift and there's no public transportation for people who are working on, on Sundays. Um, so, I'm, but I, I know that many of the people who are New Americans are working in the, in the areas that are not inside the city limits, so I guess I am concerned about that. But I would agree that compensation and eligibility would be the two biggest concerns. Okay. Compensation and eligibility. Eligibility 
Turn. <laughs> um, uh, there's so much in my head right now, it's so hard to get it organized, but thank you for the uh, issues being laid out. Um, I just want to follow up on what you said. That we have an incoming uh, new American population. Their kids, many of them are very young, and they will be having new babies, obviously. So um, one of the challenges is to um, both be accommodating but also help integrate different cultural approaches to raising children. Um, my information from, from many years ago, excuse me, is that 80% um, of the neurological connections in the brain of a child is completed within the first two months of life. So when you say six weeks, most of the, those connections have already been completed in the home before babies come to the uh, category of uh, zero to three year age. So um, uh, when you say what are the, 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 the things we should focus on, what I, uh, I wanna, I heard the term quality of teacher service, uh, that's a nebulous term and I want to expand on that. I've been in education, in higher education for 45 years and I did grow up in a setting of childcare in a third world country, no less. So um, I remember s uh, several things about what made um, children feel um, that being in daycare or childcare was uh, a, um, not that different from being at home. Um, uh, my my uh, uh, mother was in a 300 uh, employee factory setting and they took breaks, obviously, uh, 10, uh, 10 o'clock and then three o'clock in the afternoon plus a, uh, a longer half an hour, 45 minute l uh, lunch break. They could go see their kids because uh, daycare was on site. So when we talk about economies of scale, um, I'm a little wary of concepts because they do reduce costs and this is a business. Reducing cost is one of the um, uh, ultimate goals of a business. But I would like us to start thinking not quite so much as a business, but as a public obligation and public service, and think about early um, child care as an integral part of uh, public education. Um, and therefore, find ways of getting public to participate, um, and perhaps the businesses themselves um, uh, uh, becoming the, the providers at the behest of a public approach. And that then, you know, um, uh, you can raise kids who are school ready and then eventually college ready. One of the things I will emphasize is in, t in terms of teacher uh, preparation is uh, if you ask me what is the most important element in a young mind to succeed in education, single most ele uh, element is developing instilling curiosity. And that happens very early on or you've lost that window of opportunity. Curiosity, instilling curiosity in young minds and teachers have to be trained to do that. Um, I'm sure you've heard of um, uh, the Montessori method which has been successful through more than 100 years now. Has a very specific method that says let the student lead the teacher, not the other way around. Uh, so my recommendation to you is to look elsewhere in other cultures and other countries and try to be open to the different things that they do, not just follow our own drummer, so to Thank speak. You. Let's hear a few, a few more and then we'll ask the experts to respond. Yes, uh, as far as facilities are concerned, um, we, we belong to First United Methodist Church at 7th and Sass. We used to have a preschool there, which has been out of business for half a century now, but there are probably quite a few empty churches in the community that could provide facilities relatively cheaply. Um, second point I want to make, I'm married to a child care giver. Our granddaughter was cared for largely by my wife during her preschool years, as I remember, is that correct? Uh, and uh, she came out, she turned out pretty good. So, and my, my wife 
doesn't need a salary, but she's too old to do that anymore. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm impressed by what you've presented to us, but I'm befuddled because I, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to know how people like us in this audience can actually provide some way of helping you to succeed. I, I, I just don't know what, what we could do besides paying taxes, which of course we do. Thank you. Well, you're, you're doing it now by going through the matrix and giving us some input uh, of which we okay. need more. Others, who else might have a thought on where would you intervene in the system? Um, I was going to mention that I cared for one of our grandchildren, and uh, she did. She has turned out pretty special. <laughs> but I also have art in my background, and music in my background, and so we in, went to the park because I like to do that, and it gave me a reason to go and push the swings. So it was it was a gift to me that I could do that and use the gifts God has given me. But then we have a family, our son's family has three boys, and they were homeschooled. And they had mental problems, which they didn't discover for a while. And then they sent the one boy, and, and he had had them from the time he was little. And so being homeschooled, hid everything, and his mother didn't pay much attention to them at all. And the one boy was nasty to his middle brother, and so the middle brother stayed away from his younger brother. So there were problems because they were homeschooled, and I'm concerned about that. But then my husband goes to the gym, and they have a wonderful child care What's the name of the gym? Fitness U. It's a huge, huge building. And when he goes to the gym, I walk up and down the hallways where the kids are. Oh my gosh, this little boy, this tall, he was building things. They had art there, they had music. So there are places with big spaces, but the families have to get there. Thank you. You make a good case for quality care. Another thought. Uh, hi, Art Leopold. Um, wonderful panel, wonderful work. Your efforts are much appreciated. Many, many thoughts, many questions. Uh, one question that comes up, knowing that the population in our schools is about 63, 64% minority or BIPOC, I, I have a concern to make sure that our daycares match that level of diversity. Uh, it's very important in the learning process in particular. So uh, however that can be achieved, it would be wonderful. Also, I know investment's important, both local, state, federal, and private funding. <clears throat> like Howard said, we, if you could give us a list of a couple, three things that the public can, can do to support your efforts, that would be wonderful. And last comment. I'm sure there are communities that you might consider best practice communities. I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel, although I love Creative Sparks. I think that if we look at other communities and the best ones out there, I think that will lead us in a good direction, and I thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the good and the bad news is we're in the same boat as just about everywhere else. It's hard to find a best community. This hasn't been figured out very well anywhere. But there are some creative funding sources. Philadelphia has a tax on sugary beverage, soda pop. Yes. Maybe that's a good segue to my comment. Uh, I am a woman of childbearing age who does not have children yet, but you guys are opening my eyes to a lot of questions and considerations I have. And my best friend happened to have had a baby this past week who I will be visiting this afternoon, so I shouldn't grill her with a bunch of political questions about the childcare crisis, but it's definitely top of Take mind. Take her to the metri matrix. Yes. <laughs> Uh, my world is environmental advocacy, so I'm often thinking about funding streams and opportunities around economic development. So I'm not going to speak to anything specifically on this list. I trust your expertise, and I know I'd be coming at it with very limited expertise. 
But Court's comment in the beginning about the types of subsidies we provide for economic development and the impacts there and the impacts of property tax and school tax abatement on critical issues of quality of life kind of sparked an interest I had. A lot of this says the word subsidy, but doesn't quite get to the stage yet of where that subsidy would come from, and I know that's part of your process, but there's a lot of conversation right now around the LERDA program for the city and assessing its effectiveness, so I'd encourage you to take a look at, now that we've gotten to so many years of that program, what has the impact been, and what does it mean to give commercial and industrial properties 100% property tax abatement and 80% school tax abatement, and what would a reform of that look like for community services such as your own? And the same conversation is happening around a CRIS for the city of Erie, a 100 plus acre area of the city. How can we think critically about providing community benefit standards for those types of investment that get at the critical early life issues that you all are focusing on? How, how can we set a higher standard for what it means to invest and have the private sector give back to some of these public needs? I will stop there before I really get on a soapbox, but that's where my mind went at the beginning of the presentation, so thank you. It's a good point. Perhaps the conversation in Erie, a topic on which I wrote another piece for JES, Community Benefit Agreements, might have had a, a more positive response in the community where it focused on child care benefits. Uh, one more here, then we'll conclude in five minutes. Well, the last thing that you said, Court, before you started asking for uh, the audience input, and the last thing that Jenny just said uh, were the same, and that is that this effort requires the support of the business community. And uh, I'm, I'm so impressed with, this, with this, <laughs> this panel today. This team, if anybody can make this happen, this, this team could do it. Uh, I'm so impressed with what, everything you've said. A few years ago, I don't know, maybe a decade ago now, uh, the Economic Research Institute uh, out at uh, PSU Behrend uh, did, they, they did as their annual kind of public program exploring a community issue, did it on, on uh, pre-K. And like this gathering, I'm so grateful to everybody that is here, but it's conspicuous, and, and that was in particular, because that, that gathering, that e e economic research gathering, was always well attended by business people, rooms full of suits. For the one on pre-K, they were absent. They were absolutely absent. They weren't there. They, they hear the term they're talking about, educating children, it's a children's issue, it's like, has nothing to do with me whereas this is such a core issue to the economic health of the community. And the data that was presented at that institute, as well as everything that you all have said today, roundly supports the fact that uh, uh, better pre-K <coughs> uh, pre uh, education and care is critical to a community's success, ultimately. Uh, so thank you for what you're doing. But the business community needs to show up. Uh, and uh, it's great that Nick, Nick Scott Jr. has been such an avid spokesperson for it. But we, well, I want to see the rest of those guys out there speaking up for this issue and getting the politicians in our communities to support it as well, because they'll respond to those business people. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Uh, team, uh, reflections on what you heard. Anything change your top vote or add to it? Um, if you could share the microphone around. And thank you, everyone, for your thoughtful input. We'll be taking it to heart. I just have one thought from this oh, gal here in the front when you were talking about business. The reason that we want to keep our staff is that the primary attachment to the caregiver in the classroom is the most critical part of the child's day. So in an infant room at CDC, we even limit the number of people that are permitted to cover a break because the relationship built between the child and the caregiver is like the relationship that is started when you're caring for your grandchild. It is a very intimate um, relationship that impacts the child's brain. So in our plea for staff, our plea 
is not for the accounting position at our office. Our plea is for the teachers and the staff members that are in the rooms. Um, when we want to keep our people, we want to keep them so that you don't have a different, you, six month old, don't see a different face tomorrow, two weeks from now, and three months from now. Because we, with our background, we know that it's going to impact the child's growth and their development. Um, right. So that, that's our big purpose. Uh, I can't remember which of the team, but in one of our conversations, you said in your whole career, you've never seen children in as much current duress or trauma and what that means for the challenge uh, of the caregivers. Anybody comment on that? I just want to add, there are businesses that are involved. There's leader businesses in our community who are listening and they want to get involved. So that's very important. But what you can do to help us is share with them if you know someone in a business um, what's what's going on. But our children are hurting, definitely. We, we are seeing more behaviors in our centers than we have ever seen. Um, and we are screaming for help um, and support. And there are some initiatives that are coming out that will help um, train the teachers because we have a lot of new staff. But the children are hurting, the parents are hurting, and the staff are overwhelmed and stressed. And we need to help fix the system. I just I wanted to just comment too around the business engagement. Um, and this is going to sound interesting coming from the person on the panel whose job it is to provide consulting and technical assistance to businesses to do this. But that's not ultimately the answer. Um, if you think about historically, we've tied things like health care to employment status. And that has created huge disparities in our health outcomes in our different populations. So. Although we want the business community to step up and understand that this is part of the public good and part of creating a family-friendly culture in their workplace, I want to caution us, this is not the panacea, having businesses support this. Because the minute we start to link access to quality early learning experiences to parents' employment status, we're going to create the, it, we're going to just increase the disparities that are already in existence about, you know, in terms of access to high quality programming for BIPOC children. Um, so I just want to caution that. So that's again, when I work with businesses, it really isn't about most of the times about how to do this for your employees. It's about how do you partner with that local childcare provider who knows what they're doing and is I talk all the time about the fact, I think childcare providers, people will say that they don't have business sense or that, you know, they're educators and that's part of the problem. And I would challenge you, if people have gotten through a pandemic and been able to figure all of this out and still be operating, there's some pretty good business sense there. Um, we might need to build on some things, but I would challenge that. So how do we invest in those local programs in a way that's gonna benefit that employer's staff but is also gonna benefit the entire community. So I think when we talk about business engagement, we have to be really clear that this isn't just about taking care of your own, it's about taking care of an entire community. Thank you, Karen, that's a perfect place to end. We thank you all for um, allowing us to share thoughts with you. Please stay tuned, return often to the JES website where this team bi-weekly will be publishing editorials on the different aspects of the complex system and uh, maybe back to the theme that we wish to present that Erie's uh, killer app for its prosperity and competitive success in today's changing economy is being a family friendly city and childcare pays dividends and benefits all up and down the line for everybody. Thank you all so much.